I am I'm Brian Clemens. Um, I'm the uh, project manager of the Rocky Linux project, and uh, I'm the vice president of the uh, Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation, and uh, passing it off to Greg. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg. Um, let's see. I've been in Linux and open source for quite a while now. Um, let's see, ever since the mid to mid to late nineties, uh, initially started off in, in bio and, uh, pharmaceuticals and then, uh, made the bridge over into general science and, uh, computing at, uh, Berkeley lab department of energy, uh, joint appointment to UCOP and, uh, where I, where I help scientists and researchers on high performance computing and, uh, it's part of a bunch of cool open source projects. Over the um, since then, including CentOS and um, and if you're in the high performance computing space, things like Singularity, Aptainer, Werewolf, etc. Um, and um, I am lucky enough to be part of this group uh, with Rocky Linux. And so, I'll pass the mic off to let's see, Neil. You're the first one that popped up for me. So, hi, I'm uh, Neil Hanlon. I'm one of the infrastructure team leads here for the RESF. Um, I've been in been in Linux for probably too long, but it's it's continuing to, to be too long. So um, I guess I'll keep doing it. Um, I, I got my start back when I was probably in my teens uh, with a Ubuntu disk my brother brought home from college. Uh, it's kind of come full circle now. He's uh, he's gone. He went over to the dark side for a while to Apple, and uh, back last. Last year, he, he was asking me for recommendations on how to install Linux, so he's, he's coming back. <laughs> uh, Krista, did you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Krista. I'm just happy to be here. No, I'm teasing. Um, I... Hi, I'm the community manager for the uh, Rocky Linux project. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I've been doing this for uh, two or three months now. I don't know. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun just to get to know everybody on the project and to to learn personalities and also to learn how everything works together. It's been a great opportunity this last week to just sit and watch as they the team worked through their release project, um, trying to get the newest version ready for release. Um, has been very enlightening and mostly I've just learned a lot of new words that I need to go learn what they mean. Uh, Krista, um, Krista, yeah. Krista, 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 um, earrings. What do you, what, what are those? Oh yeah. Do y'all like my earrings? Only the very specialist people that are part of Rocky Linux have a set of these. Um, they were sent to me in the mail by some people that live out your way, I believe. Greg. Um, so this is the first, my first road test. They're officially on camera now. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm having a great time. That's my job. And maybe I'll say some more things later, but that's good for my introduction. Yeah. And Chris has done an amazing job at spinning up our uh, latent community team. Uh, for a long time, uh, that, that team lead seat was a little uh, under, underutilized. So uh but you know we're we're getting back in the swing of things now, which is great. Um, so let's hear on to uh, Sharif. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sharif. I'm a part of the uh, Rocky Linux release engineering team. Uh, mainly, I'm focusing on getting the secure boot um, environment and set up up and running. And on my day job, I work as a senior cybersecurity officer for the uh, Irish Center for High-End Computing, where we manage the uh, Irish National Service for High Performance Computing for all researchers. Thanks, Sharif. And also, it, it took me a minute to realize that that wasn't a real background. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's hear. Uh, Chris. I'm Stack. Um, I am the testing team lead. Uh, tried to help out with anything on release day for uh, doing quality assurance checks and uh, verify as much as we can to make sure things work well. Uh, I also help out with the uh, SIG Alt Arch uh, and am working uh, with Sharif and some of the others to get a wide variety of the single board computers 
available to run under Rocky. Uh, it's been very hard to get your hands on a Raspberry Pi, which seems to be very popular. But there are plenty of other boards, but some of the other boards are a mixture of weird drivers, weird kernels, weird support, uh, inconsistent distro stuff. Um, we're hoping to grow that community, um, especially with those that like to have the small form factor uh, systems uh, with uh, Rocky Linux. Awesome. And okay, uh, we, we've only had to sell a few contracts for our firstborns in order to get uh, those Raspberry Pis, but luckily they're coming through. Uh, on to Taylor. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Taylor Goodwill, and um, I've been uh, working with Rocky since the beginning of the project. I also am uh, one of the leads of the infrastructure team, uh, mainly just trying to keep uh, tools running and uh, things going to serve the community and the, the process at large. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, Scott? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Scott Shen. I'm on the Rocky Linux security team. Um, I'm also a maintainer of a number of um, uh, open source security projects. Uh, the big one that I'm uh, just joined in the last, I guess, decade is um, it's called OSEC, which is a host based uh, intrusion detection system. But um, I'm also involved with uh, Clam AV, Mod Security, OpenBaz, uh, and several others. And this is Tater Tot. He is also on the security team. And uh, you will almost always see him uh, on any uh, any feed we do with Rocky Linux project. Back to you, Brian. Thanks. Yeah, we. Uh, a anytime I see Scott, I need him to turn that camera on for Tater. But um, and I, I I didn't know we were doing uh, Linux villain or, or uh, origin stories. So uh, my 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 story is I started out with Fedora Core four on a what was it a Toshiba Satellite L twenty five which was some college student special piece of junk from Best Buy. And uh, I, I ended up going with Linux just because I wanted to get access to uh, free Wi-Fi. And uh, so there we go. I loaded up the uh, those uh, Mad Wi-Fi NG drivers and AirCrack, and there we go. Suddenly I had faster internet um, thanks to my neighbor's uh, DSL when my parents still had uh, dial-up. So... There we go. That was fun. All right. So it's been a while since we were last here. I think the biggest thing to touch on, the biggest uh, difference has been Rocky Linux 9 and all the associated tooling that we actually put together in order to make Rocky Linux 9 happen. So Ro uh, Rocky Linux 8, we actually started out with the conventional build system that's used for enterprise Linux. So, you know, Koji and you know, all, all that sort of thing. Well, we, we actually built some tooling around that too, uh, distro build, some additional uh, tooling to uh, make Rocky Linux 8 builds easier. But uh, Rocky Linux 9 uses an entirely new build system uh, called Peridot. Um, Actually, uh, it, Neil, do you mind if I put you on the spot to talk about Peridot a little bit? Or Okay, I'll take that as a yes. So uh, Peridot is actually very cool because it, it, it's a cloud-native build system. It takes full advantage of it, the functionality that we have in the cloud. So it can spin up instances to uh, actually... yeah. Uh, it, it can spin up build workers and that sort of thing. We also have our build workers in, what is it, OSU, OSL? So that we can build like some additional architectures. So for example, PowerPC, S390X, um, that sort of thing. Uh, so Rocky Linux 9 was an impetus to really, you know, create our own infrastructure uh, for building that's actually that actually works for us. We're looking at moving our builds of Rocky Linux 8 to Peridot as well. Um, that work is ongoing. Uh, another, well, uh, before I uh, move on, um, any anyone want to say anything about uh, Peridot? Taylor, Sharif? Wow, okay. Okay, so moving on. 
another I can, big I, can, I never I, yeah I, I always talk you, so you can always call on me if you need to fill some space um uh, a couple cool things about um peridot really was trying to solve some of the issues that early centos had with regards to uh small teams that was um really we had to manage the security envelope of trusted keys of, of what we were doing with the operating system. And as a result, we, we didn't, we didn't have a huge, you know, number of people that we, you know, quote unquote trusted with, with those keys. So the people that built CentOS was, it was always a very small team. Uh, we wanted to always ensure that we had the ability to create a larger, more diverse team uh, and people coming into the project. And one of the things that we identified we needed to do is to create uh, a solution for trusted build pipelines and supply chain. And uh, Peridot was built along this line of, of thinking and, and how do we do that better? And as Brian uh, mentioned, it is a cloud native build system. Uh, the intent is for us to be able to very easily and quickly spin it up into um, you know with with just Helm charts, so people can go and reproduce everything that we're doing with Rocky Linux. Uh, one more point I'll just make really quick is that every version of Rocky Linux that we've ever released is completely reproducible uh, from the perspective of everything is based on open source tooling that is freely available uh, and 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 community uh, maintain and run. And so um, with Peridot, we're just trying to make that easier. Uh, that, that's one of the best ways that we can endure longevity and survival of the project is to ensure that others can reproduce it in a true kind of open source community way. Uh, so that's been a big focus for us. Yep. And like you said, uh, uh, expanding or the ability to sort of give more people access to the build system is also extremely helpful with our uh our burgeoning uh, special interest group community. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, Stack can talk a lot about this simply because uh, of the alt arch SIG being probably our most popular SIG at the moment. Um, but yeah, Peridot is going to make life much easier for SIGs. You don't have to go around <laughs> like uh, seeking approval from release engineering to do what you need to do. Another big change that we've made is just organization wise, we've actually, we've been working on this a long time and we probably talked about it last time too, but standing up the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation as a uh, fiscal host for this project and other projects. Um, so that it took, honestly, since the start, it, I mean, we, we really started talking about this in December, 2020 like uh we've been talking about this for a long time about how we actually want to legally organize the project and ensure its longevity um and uh build an organization that ensures that and uh so we finally it, it took a long time to put together a charter that everyone was happy with and a set of bylaws that everyone was happy with. Uh, we've gone through several iterations, you know, we, we've gone through multiple rounds of lawyer approval and that sort of thing. Uh, and when we finally got something, we finally got something through, uh, when was that? When were the elections? Um, no, don't ask me. Time is a ridiculous yeah. blur. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's weird because I still there often January, like remember. I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I still sometimes like remember conversations that I feel like happened last month, and then it turns out that they were back when we were still on Slack and didn't have Mattermost yet. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's yeah, but um, yeah. So we finally got elections through. Um, it, we we elected a, a good board of folks, um, and we're we're actually running with that now. Um, so that kind of takes the burden of some of the boring stuff, like financials and that sort of thing, and takes that off of the Rocky Linux project, which is definitely helpful. Um, in addition to that, we managed to do the Rocky Linux project board elections, uh, and let's see. 
we also spun off the Peridot project as its own uh, uh, project, independent project uh, under the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation as well. Um, and they, they, they had their election. Luckily that, that was a, uh, very easy one to do since, uh, it's a, it's a, it was a pretty obvious group of folks working on that. Uh, let's see here. What else should we brush on? Actually, uh, I think a, a fun thing to talk about would probably be FIPS. Uh, Greg, if you wanted to talk a bit about that. Sure. Um, so we promised FIPS <laughs> to the community at, at an early stage, and there was a lot of um, skepticism that we got uh, as a result of that, because FIPS is a very expensive process, and it's a long process to, uh, to implement. Uh, also, in conjunction with that, if you're familiar with FIPS, there's different uh, versions of FIPS. Uh, the version of FIPS that most people have been using for, for quite some time, and Scott, please do jump in if there's anything you want to add. Um, but there's, they, we, you know, everyone was using 140-2. Right. And right when we started talking about Rocky and doing FIPS for Rocky, uh, it, was, it was moving to 140-3, and right. they basically just end of life 140-2. Now, there's a lot of complexities as a result of that. There's a lot of background uh, uh, echoes and whatnot. Uh, cool, thanks. Um, so what we wanted to do is, again, we wanted to get FIPS compliance. But to do that, we, we basically now had to go and rework the base operating system, which originally um, was pretty close to 140-2. But then there was a lot of changes we had to implement for 140-3. And so we've been doing this um, on the CIQ side uh, for, oh my goodness, I'd say a year, almost a, almost a full year at this point. Um, it is now well over a million dollar investment to get this done. And this is one of the reasons why it came through uh, CIQ. But one of the commitments from CIQ was to ensure that this goes back to the community and it's not held hostage by CIQ or, or any company. And so CIQ is actually putting the FIPS certification in the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation name. And all of those FIPS certified binaries are going to be released um, publicly available. Uh, so what is currently in the government labs as of right now are all five modules for um, uh, Rocky Linux 8.6. And I can talk a little bit about why it's 8.6 and the versioning and whatnot around that in just a moment, but those are all in the government uh, labs right now getting tested and validated, which means it could be anywhere from, you know, a month from now, maybe two months from now to they, another they eight months from at now. government speed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I want to point out something really important about this, this effort uh, that CIQ, uh, I don't work for CIQ, uh, it has done is that this is, uh, Rocky Linux is the only community uh, operating system to have this. There's no, there's nothing else that has this. So so there's certainly commercial distributions of Linux like Red Hat and and um, and Oracle Linux that have it, and and Ubuntu one, but uh, Rocky Linux is the only community uh, platform at all in the world that has this um, across any operating system. Not even just Linux. It could be you know <laughs> pick out like Open Solaris or something like that. N none of them have this. So it's a it's a huge deal uh, for us and the security team to be able to say. We have validated cryptographic modules across the, the board. We're talking, and, I, and certainly I, I think Sharif can even speak to this. We're talking kernel down. Like, I mean, no, it's not even kernel down. It's it's BIOS down. Like, so we have a chain of trust from hardware to user land with this. And um, yeah, again, from the, from the security team, you know, to have uh, to be able to, to, to put that feather in our cap is a pretty big deal. Yep. We, we got tons of people when we started this project asking us about FIPS and common criteria certification and that sort of thing. Um, and so we're, we're really glad that, you know, we will be able to offer this. And yeah, as Scott said, um, so Ubuntu used to have free FIPS certified modules, but now you have to subscribe to what is it called? Ubuntu plus or something? Ubuntu one. Ubuntu one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and let's see here. Oracle, I think, also has a few. Like, I, I'm not sure if they have everything 
FIPS certified or, but, um, you know, it, it, it's Oracle, so it's not exactly one to one with uh, Enterprise Linux. Um, but yeah, okay. And actually, uh, Greg, I realized I, I, I forgot to pass back to you uh, regarding the RESF stuff, if you wanted to talk about that as well. Um, I think I think pretty much everything you mentioned regarding RESF is was perfect. Um, maybe the only thing I would I would just add is the motivation of of what we're trying to solve and why we're trying to solve it. Um, you know, one of the things that when we first spun up Rocky Linux, one of the things that we heard from a number of of organizations and 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 people in the community was, um, you know, we want this to be truly community. We do not want a company holding this hostage in, in, a, in a situation where they could, you know, end of life, you know, an operating system that's, that's foundational to a lot of their, their infrastructure. Um, I mean, you know, Red Hat has, you know, been one of the fan, the, the, the best open source, you know, companies, open source supporting companies ever. And for them to do this, you know, kind of shook people up a little bit. Uh, and we've seen this a number of times. It wasn't just Red Hat that's that's done this. I mean, you know, this has happened, you know, going back a number of years, all the way back to, I think MongoDB was probably one of the first ones that got a lot of press and attention. Uh, and even after, you know, CentOS did this, um, Elastic did exactly the same thing, right? They pivoted the project in a way that um, was no longer open source. So one of the messages we heard loud and clear was do not let a single company run this and and make sure that this uh, stays free of corporate uh, control and and it cannot be held hostage. Uh, so as we started developing and thinking about this, um, it was a little bit of a pivot to be to be honest of how I was initially thinking about it, which was, you know, I have a, I have a company, it, it's well funded, and. You know, we can put in money and invest in this, and this can be under the the, the company CIQ. Uh, very quickly, we decided that would be a a very bad thing to do to the community, and so we CIQ has always taken a non controlling role with regards to to Rocky Linux, all the way to the point where when we develop the 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 bylaws and the charter for the RESF. It limits any sort of single corporation involvement over one third of um, uh, of, of any uh, people representing a single company on the board. So the board is always going to be free of uh, a single company influence as it's as it is written and as it is executed. So that that's a really big difference. Couple that with. Nobody, no company can ever buy a board seat. All board seats are merit based is also a fairly you know, significant differentiator with, with other op projects. And in some cases, other open source foundations um, that are out there, right? We're not selling board seats. There's no pay to pay to control or pay to play uh, model. It is all based on merit and based on uh, people that are involved with that project and with the community. And so this we felt you know gave us a really good foundation for ensuring that there's not going to be any sort of negative control of this and, and the one thing i'll mention is this is this is not done right so we're, we're still we're still working on this and we're still always trying to make this better um at the moment uh this is this is not um a done thing by any means but one of the things we said early on is you know we're going to investigate even becoming a um a a you know, a tax or non, um, uh, what is it called? <laughs> Ta uh, um, nonprofit, sorry. <laughs> Becoming a nonprofit. And does that actually also solve the needs of what it is that we're trying to do? Now, historically, I have not been of the opinion that nonprofits do a great job of protecting open source communities. Um, and, and of course, there's a lot of cases in which they have. So it's, it's a minority case, of course, but um, under, under, some conditions, you know, they may not be very protective. So, uh, you know, we, we have not done it yet. It is currently a public benefits organization. And, um, but we are considering, you know, converting this over to a nonprofit. And I'm currently working with several nonprofit um, attorneys and um, experts to figure out how is the best way of doing this. The last point I'll mention in this is um, nonprofits do not uh, are not magic pills 
or guarantees of integrity. Uh, really, <laughs> we, I, I've known lots of corrupt nonprofits where um, they did not do exactly what they said. And, and uh, we've just seen recently a nonprofit that became one of the most valuable uh, companies um, ever, which is OpenAI. Right? They started off as a, as a nonprofit, as an example, um, and then converted and pivoted uh, after they got funding which was uh, non-equity based funding. Very kind of interesting situation. Sam did, <laughs> Sam did um, some, some uh, interesting things there. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but again- That's What I was actually going to mention is that I'm not taking a side and saying it was right or wrong or anything like that, but I know there's a lot of people in the community very upset about it. So it is a very timely, very public transition where a nonprofit did not necessarily protect the, the organization. So using the nonprofit as an excuse or a similar bullet to magically protect it is not it, which is why Greg is being so careful in the decision of how we handle this. The public benefit Listen. company may actually be more protection for the community than nonprofit. Um, that is yeah, exactly, is. yeah, that is exactly nonprofit, what Nonprofits going rogue for profit is pretty old. Um, the Congress and the Air Force got royally pissed off when um, SDC, the software development company, merged with Burroughs and the regents of the U California uh, reaped a windfall. The Air Force was unhappy. Not only really that, I mean, it. A, a lot of nonprofits are really just like nonprofits in name only. I mean, that the, the NFL was a nonprofit for uh, until what was it? I think like, yeah, I, 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 I forget when they changed out, but yeah, called a not nonprofit. If you eat all of the nonprofit as lobster at the annual meeting. Uh, instead of distributing dividends, it can be a nonprofit. You just have to make the profit disappear. Or you, you know what? Maybe I'm just not understanding it correctly, and the NFL just never doesn't make any money. Maybe you, you never know. The the league office doesn't have to make money as long as the members do. There we go. As um, as so actually, money. something I wanted to uh, bring up. Uh, sorry to bounce back, but I, I was reminded when we were talking about uh, security earlier in FIPS. Uh, so our uh, another big change that we've made recently is our secure boot environment. We, we, we've completely shifted the way that we do secure boot. And uh, Sharif actually came prepared to talk a little bit about that. Um, so uh, I'd be honestly, I, I'm kind of looking forward to his talk. Uh, so, Sharif, if you wanted to uh, talk about that. Um, sure. So, um, we had Secure Boot since Rocky 8.5. And that's a little bit of an involving uh, process and a little bit painful. Um, not also from the technical side, but also from the uh, approval side. So, if you don't know Secure Boot, basically, the way that you can have a chain of trust between your hardware and up to the kernel and the kernel module. So the BIOS or the framework of the hardware will have is um, a, a, well, something which we call platform key, which is coming from your vendor that sign a special key that called the um, uh, kick that signs a database that includes two certificate that are mainly Microsoft and some hardware will have an Ubuntu certificate. And, and, and this was a requirement from um, Microsoft when they released, I think, Windows 7, that they need to have to make sure that any operating system will run, need to run in a secure boot environment if you need to enable secure boot. And, 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 and so the Linux community came together and they wrote something called CHIM which is like a very early um, uh, boot stage. 
And you as a distro, so us as a Rocky and Rocky uh, Enterprise Software Foundation, we have a CA embedded into the our shim, and we have to go through another process, which is verifying the foundation with extended certificates, and then Microsoft will sign our shim for us. And then we can sign our Grub kernel and FWUPD, which we use to update the framework on the hardware um, via certificate that is uh, trusted by our CA, and that's how you get secure boot. So your hardware trusts your shim, your shim then will verify that your kernel uh, and, 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 and Grub and FWD are uh, secure and trusted. And this will allow you to make sure that your machine shouldn't run any kind of uh, non-trusted code before the kernel boots and the grub. Of course, as everything, there is some security holes that might happen. And there was a very famous one that just got fixed on the 9th of May, this like a week ago, which called the Black Lotus, which was a bug in actual Microsoft boot manager for the secure boot. And um, but but now we can make sure that you have all this kind of trust. The issue that we were facing at the beginning um, that there is not enough information clear and also the Microsoft requirement is very uh, restrictive. So all the operation has to be in a FIPS 140-2 level two compliant data centers, which is we were able to fulfill. All the keys, everything is in, in, in FIPS 140-2 level three for physical tampering. And uh, recently we decided to shift a little bit to have, um, to build our own in this secure facility, uh, our own HSM, which will allow us to be able to sign multiple architectures to get secure boot moved to um, different um, like RPC and, um, and, Z, and Z systems. And that will allow you as an end user not if you don't want to use Microsoft certificates because some of them are not supporting this hardware, you can roll your own certificates and you still have secure boot running with your all your um, your environment. And the first distro we are testing this with at the moment is actually um, Rocky 9.2. So all the certificate keys and the environment that's signing the secure boot for 9.2 is the new um, the new architecture that we built. Uh, back to you, Brian. Ah, uh, thanks, Sharif. All right. So, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's kind of interesting. One thing that actually kind of uh, spurred on our uh, transition to our new secure boot environment is the fact that the uh, the data center <laughs> that uh, our old environment was in was actually closed. Um, so that kind of helped. Uh, okay, so on to uh, Krista to talk about uh, some of our com upcoming community participation. Maybe a review of what we've done so far. Um, yeah, uh, it's been exciting for me to feel like part of this team of going and being an ambassador for Rocky Linux. Um, it's so much fun to engage with the community and to feel like I'm not selling anything, but goodwill and good vibes and connection um, and allowing people to connect over um, the values that Rocky Linux has as a platform that it shares with open source. Um, so far, since I, I, I know that people have been to events before, but in the last, since the beginning of the year, which is about when I've been aware of it, um, one of our documentation team and I were able to travel last weekend out to Portland and attend a technical writing conference called Write the Docs. And we got to be representatives for Rocky Linux there. Um, one of the things was we had a chance to run a writing day and to um, invite people to, to begin to work on our documentation platform, um, specifically working on one of our projects, which is to go through and make sure all of our wording and all of our existing documentation is consistent um, and proper um, and up to date. So that's um, one of our current initiatives that we're working on. Coming up here in a couple weeks, we're gonna be attending the 
Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. That'll be the first, no, the second weekend of June. And then immediately after that, a couple of us are going to head straight from there up to Vancouver, British Columbia to the Open Infra Conference. And I know what the Linux Fest is about. I'm sure that the Open Infra Conference is about infrastructure. Um, and I'm learning all the way. I love the chance, though, to meet people and engage and to pass out stickers. That's that's my personal favorite part. And we're we're pretty excited about the Open Infra con conference because uh, Neil is actually a, a, a contributor to us a few Open Infra projects. Uh, if you wanted to touch on that, Neil. Yeah, uh, that's a project I've been working on for a little over a year now. Um, been working with the OpenStack Ansible folks, uh, which is a deployment project for OpenStack based on Ansible, or you're using Ansible. So it um, it uses a set of playbooks to build out a cluster and maintain a cluster. And the point of it is kind of to um, provide a, a way to integrate with maybe your existing uh, configuration management system and something you're comfortable with to be able to run that cluster and then also perform day two operations on that cluster, like doing upgrades, managing all of the different projects and tenants that you have and and um, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's a great way to get up and started with, with OpenStack uh, if you're not familiar with it as well. Um, it can be a really great learning resource. Um, so that's something I've been working on for the past kind of year or so. and. Uh, um, have actually migrated from or helped them move over from running tests on top of CentOS and CentOS Stream uh, kind of through that whole migration process of um, what to do with CentOS and getting over from CentOS 8 to CentOS 9 Stream. And then uh, ultimately recently we've, we've had to make the decision to um, change the tests over to Rocky uh, from CentOS. And we're still doing the CentOS tests, but uh, they're, they're set to non-voting just because they, we've had so, so many issues with them, which is a good and a bad thing. Um, you know, the, the the bad thing is that bugs are, are not great, but the good thing is that it's it's given us the opportunity to also help go and, and contribute those fixes and changes upstream and report bugs to CentOS and work with the community there. So um, overall, it's been it's been super great. And um, recently, they they nominated me to be a core reviewer uh, for for the projects there. So that's been um, you know just another cool thing, I guess, to put on my resume. And uh, I fooled more people into trusting me. So that's uh, always a good thing. <laughs> there we go. Let's see here. We can we can ride on your coattails, Neil. Let's see here. <laughs> it, it now, was kind of interesting, too. It's, it's come back like a little full, full circle. I got my kind of start, I guess, into open source. Maybe that's when I was uh, radicalized or something uh, at uh, OpenStack Summit back in 2016. Um, it was actually in Boston. That was like the first conference I really attended. It was maybe my second year of working in a job and, and going there. And uh, I think it'll be fun to go back and see it with a different set of eyes. <laughs> and you picked up a pamphlet there that said like what, how to talk to your children about open source software or something. There we go. <laughs> It's, actually, it's kind of funny. There's a book on my bookshelf the, about OpenStack networking. And one of the guys that, or the guy that wrote that book is um, one of the contributors to OpenStack Ansible too. So I was like, I have your book. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, speaking of uh, contributing upstream and reporting bugs upstream, uh, a recent incident that it, it, we're, <laughs> we're kind of excited to talk. Well, I, I'm not sure if excited is the right word, but um, something that really proved um, our QA testing to be thorough is uh, during the production of uh, Rocky Linux 9.2, we actually encountered a, a pretty significant issue with uh, Python on uh, PowerPC. And uh, so stack it or did you want to uh, talk about how the testing team discovered this and how it was handled well i mean it was a little bit of a whole lot of teams plus a lot of community feedback to, to handle it um but yes so um rocky has a fairly extensive uh testing process um 
and uh you know there there's a lot of trolls out there that immediately will jump on and say what you're saying other projects don't test no <laughs> what i'm saying is we go overboard <laughs> we do a lot because we don't want to break things for our user base um and so we test a lot of known configurations that have caused problems in the past um we have uh looked to uh projects like fedora and OpenSUSE uh, for how they do a lot of their qa testing we use uh open qa um, as our uh, baseline for a lot of tests that we automate to do a lot of installations across a variety of platforms, which we're currently expanding on. Um, and so we test a whole lot of stuff. Um, a lot of the very common methods that people install, how they install from network installs to ISO installs, upgrade paths, we test a wide variety of things. Um, and uh, we check, we've got a fairly large checklist of things that we go through. Uh, we have some that are require some setup for like OpenQA, kind of you need to know a little bit about it to jump in. But we also have a lot of community testable items, um, things as simple as can you burn this to a CD and boot it? Well, not CD anymore, a DVD. <laughs> um, because we do have a lot of environments still that, uh, you know, they're kind of closed environments and that's how they do their installs and updates are physical media. Um, and that's something that anybody with a, you know, a DVD writer and a, a couple of discs can help out with um, to doing something as like, well, I don't have a DVD writer anymore, but do you have a spare thumb drive? If you've got a spare conference drive that is, you know, eight to 16 gig, um, we have tests to be able to uh, DD our image to a thumb drive and can you boot that? Um, so there's a lot of uh, very simple tasks and items. Um, even things like uh, take an existing system and update. Does firewall still work? Does SSH still work? Um, I mean, those seem like simple items, but they've bitten somebody in the past. And so we check for these things. Um, with regards to this one specifically, uh, notice that uh, the installs were failing. And uh, we had to pull in um, pretty quickly uh, uh, several people. Um, to kind of look at it and uh i mean neil you're the one who beat your head on this for a weekend before we really pulled in and had a war room of what was it like 20 people at one point uh assisting in that jitsi call i mean it was pretty extensive of trying to dig in and figure out the root cause and whether or not it broke things for everybody or just a specific use case yeah that was that was kind of incredible how many people were on that call and on 20 or on monday the 20 or so people i was kind of not expecting that many people to be interested first of all and, and also available to join and, and participate so that was that was super cool and really helpful and i think a, a great part of our community is definitely the testing team for sure the bug itself was very weird i thought like i mean i spent the week again just thinking it with my tooling for building the images uh, <laughs> and it took us a long time to um, even think like, hey, maybe this is actually a problem with something else and not our bug, um, which is a, a lesson in and of itself, I think, you know, to reevaluate, take a step back, uh, get some other eyes on it, get some other more opinions. And, and uh, it's, it's an excellent reminder to make sure that we we do that and, and take a step back to look at those sorts of, uh, of problems there. I think we not not that it would have changed anything, but it would have uh, saved it maybe some headache um, to to at least identifying kind of a root cause and nailing it down so that we could open a bug report. But yeah, we're we're very proud that our uh, QA team managed to catch that. Uh, so our releases might come out uh maybe a little slower than other projects but it's because of this extensive testing uh we do things right or not at all um and uh that issue that we caught i mean that that has a potential to break existing systems i mean uh, it, uh a fresh install just doesn't work at all on it um so we actually decided to hold back updates uh, for uh, PowerPC um, on Rocky Linux 9.2 um, just for the safety of our users. Uh, 
And you know, as mentioned, these things are contributed upstream. So the, this bug was reported upstream, and you know, we're working on it ourselves as well in order to see if we can uh, contribute a fix as well. Let's see here. Okay, ten minutes left. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to leave about ten minutes for uh, any any questions uh, that anyone might have or any topics they might want to uh, touch on. Uh, is there anything that anybody wanted to uh, hear more about or any questions? All right, I'll, I'll take that one as a no, unless there's anything in the chat there. Let me see. <clears throat> oh, wait. Oh, okay. Chris has something. Here we go. Hi. I have a question actually for the user group. You all have been listening to us talk for a little bit. Um, but you look like you might be some people with uh, some experience in the Linux community, but you also look like maybe you've had some, oh, kinds of experiences like they've been describing with the, the 9.2 testing and release cycle. Um, I mean, my gosh, I've heard so many stories of people, you know, having to deal with finding a, a bug in a code and how many hours it takes to find it. But you're stuck until you get it. Um, that said, we've got 9.2 mostly released, released yesterday. And um, I hope it's not a state secret that we are now officially working on 8.8. .8 that is now is the current testing and release cycle in the queue. But in the meantime, we've got all these people who just spent a week working very long nights and long days and being really intense with their dedication to this project. They've had 24 hour break and now they're dump, jumping back into it. And so I wondered if from your life experience, if you would like to share with our team, any special pieces of advice for them as they are like in this stressful place where they're so intense um, what are your tips and tricks for getting through the hard, the hard hours and the hard days? Actually, a few months ago, uh, I'd uh, I, I previously tried to install a Rocky Nine on a VM, and it just wouldn't go. It, it was acting like it didn't recognize the CPU or something. And it was not a kind of an old machine. Uh, I mean, the uh, the VM host. But then more recently, I, I tried installing it uh, on a server I got off eBay a couple of years ago, and it seemed to have the same problem. But apparently, um, whatever it was, as far as I could tell, it was the uh, it was it couldn't boot because the CPU um, was uh, like unsupported or something. So, uh, Rocky Linux Nine uses uh, x86 v2 uh, that that microarchitecture spec, or the the minimum. Uh, uh, level of microarchitecture features on it is uh, x86 v2 which i think is isn't that everything since sandy bridge or ivy bridge i forget i think sandy bridge uh, oh, okay yeah, yeah all right um so the it, 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 do you happen to know uh what the the what generation the cpu was yeah, not offhand it's a it's a super yeah. micro rack mount, rack mount server I got on eBay for like ninety nine dollars, and uh, I have no yeah. idea how if it's, it's ninety nine dollars. It might be a little 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 aged. Um, well, I, I actually got a, a, a lot of servers like that over the years. Uh, I think they came from financial firms like Fidelity, where they'd buy a bunch of machines for ten thousand dollars one year, then they need to throw them away and get a new one the next year, and they're basically only uh, as far as they're concerned, they're only worth the cost of the scrap metal. So they put it on eBay and. Uh, Ends up being ninety nine dollars. Gotcha, but uh, yeah, that that that's a common issue that we encounter is just uh, folks working on or, or trying Rocky Nine on, well, Enterprise Linux Nine in general. All of the Enterprise Linux Nine distributions are uh, you know having users report this, but it, it's it's just because we decide. Well, Red Hat decided that the uh, minimum. Uh, microarchitecture level is uh, x86 v2. Uh, okay. I don't recall offhand exactly which CPU extensions that entails, but yeah. 
the the flip side on that is that for uh, folks using um, Apple hardware, is that you can use Rocky Nine on an M2 class CPU um, on Apple hardware, but you can't. And this again, this isn't our decision. We are we are uh, at the whim of of, uh, of upstream for this, but uh, you can't run Rocky Eight on at least with our vanilla kernel on uh, on that hardware. So it's like you know, you kind of kind of split it. Like probably in the older older class gear, Rocky Eight's the right way to go. And then on something like an M2, you know, you'd want to go with Rocky Nine. Let's see. All right. Um, uh, does, that should answer that, I think. But uh, wanted to uh, get back to Chris's qu question uh, before we forget it. Uh, her question for you guys: uh, What advice do you have for us? Not sure, but I want to retrograde a little bit. I was uh, pretty excited about the FIPS discussion. Mm -hmm. I once worked at a uh, encryption company that made radios and stuff like that. And for key exchanges, we used FIPS and had to use commercial Linux. This was, I think, before commercial Unix. This is before uh, Linux came out. I think it was the 1980s. So I've, I've got some experience in FIPS. But not yeah, so the, the FIPS thing is really interesting, too, because uh, so be, being in Japan, I work with um, a lot of organizations that require uh, different sorts of uh, certifications. And uh, so, you know, I've come across common criteria a lot. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting to try to see how all these uh, certifications work. Um, so, for example, uh, we will need to get FIPS first and then common criteria if, if we end up going for that. It's um, definitely quite, quite a few hoops to jump through in order to make that happen. Um, actually, uh, <laughs> Greg, have we is is common criteria something that's even being talked about yet, or? Uh... Um, <clears throat> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Gotcha. Yeah, that 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 that's a whole another set of hoops. The the one we're in the process of working on right now is a standard called eight hundred one seven one, which is which is effectively uh, an operating system producers certification to, in this case, the federal government, basically going over our processes. Like how, how do we, the RSF and the Rocky Linux um, in general, like how do we operate? Like how do we create a software uh, supply chain where, you know, effectively we've got separations of privileges and all sorts of very, very probably boring things like that, that, that ensure that no one person could poison the chain. And how do we, how do we defend against that kind of stuff? So that's the, probably the, the next one on our on our radar. Although I'll be honest, the the FIP certification is such a big deal because it's going through every single cryptographic module we have, all of them, uh, and it is if you know in terms of being able to do this effectively, to, to do effective crypt, uh, encryption like this, it involves hardware, it involves software, it involves you know cryptographic modules, it involves the way that we do things in user land. It is a hundred percent an operating system thing. I mean, you can't really just do it in one little piece and be done. This is a huge, huge project. Um, I'm excited that we'll that we're doing it because it's I've I've done these before in the past, but never for a community pro, uh, project like this in my life. And uh, just just addressing uh, John's question as to whether HPC is a focus for us um, in the chat there. Uh, so actually, our, our roots really are uh, HPC. Um, the Rocky Linux project started in uh, HPC NG. Um, and uh, I, actually, I still feel kind of bad about that because uh, we we blew through. They, they were using a free Slack instance. And uh, Rocky Linux got so much attention. We got, I don't know, I think we got like, 2000 users or something in like a month or, or like in a in a week 
It, 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 was, it, it, it was something crazy. It was so HBC oh, oh, okay. had about a thousand users before we before we started with Rocky Linux. Um, by the time we left, it was well over ten thousand. Oh God. Yeah, so it, it was it was kind of crazy, and just the enormous amount of uh, message traffic completely blew away all of their chat history because the free uh, free Slack server has like a chat history limit, and it was so bad that they would like post a message one day and just not have it the next day because we were just blowing through the uh, the chat history that quickly. Um, so yeah, we were, uh, we were definitely irritating the, uh, the, the, the HPC and G folks. Um, but luckily we moved to Mattermost. What was that? It was, wasn't that just one month? I think we moved to Mattermost in January, or at least that's when we started playing with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that was uh, January 21. To the point you mentioned, yeah, it, it, you know, we had so many people joining. I think a lot of people just messaged me directly. And the list of unread messages that I had, it took me hours to go from one side to the next. And it got to the point where, Brian, to your point, where I see I have an unread message. I'm te it's a direct message. And I go there and it said, you have already surpassed your 10,000 you know, messages. Um, so go get a professional account if you want to see this message. So I was like losing messages even before I can get to the message. Uh, it was, it was a crazy situation then. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was busy. All righty. Uh, any other subjects we want to, uh, touch on? Yeah. One question that I had, and I think there's been a little discussion on it. The, Project leader for um, Fedora recently got laid off by uh, Red Hat. And I'm wondering, actually, some of Ed was really wondering to me if that is going to mean that Red Hat. Uh, I think your audio cut out there. Looks like his old connection dropped. Yeah, it's not just his audio. It was oh, my bad. And this is connection lost to his name. Oh, okay. Well, he, he followed up back. in the chat uh, asking whether Red Hat would cut Fedora loose. It's... Uh, not sure if that's something that I can speculate on. To, if anyone else wants to, though. No, that was Ed. No, I love to speculate. I don't think it's good to speculate. Yeah, There's plenty of people doing that on Reddit yeah. right now, and they can exactly act yeah. speculate. But that's not really our thing. I, I think what we can say, at least, is what Matt himself has said. Like Fedora has existed for before him, and it will exist after him. Um, like these doubts what he's said publicly um and i think that's largely true it's it the fedora is a product of the community there's some nuance to that in terms of like what actually fedora is right but it, it is the community and i think that I, I personally i don't think that red hat would would do that um but that's just me um, whether it will affect Fedora, I think that we're probably in, in an okay place. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been plenty of people that predicted the demise of Fedora before, and it's never happened. So let's see. Seems we're taking an awful long time to reconnect. All right. Uh, until then. Uh, or anyone else have something? Let's see here. All right. Well, 
Uh, if uh, nobody else has something, it was definitely a pleasure uh, being here again. Really glad to see you guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it, it it is kind of funny though. Uh, I didn't realize exactly how much changed until uh, <laughs> uh, thinking about what until attending this made me think about what has changed since we were last at this group. Uh, it's kind of crazy the speed at which things move here. Yeah, it looks like Jerry reconnected. Well, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I, ah. my system locked up. Uh, please, please don't say you were on Rocky. <laughs> I was about to ask the same thing. <laughs> I was on Rocky. <laughs> no, oh no, I was on Fedora. All right. So, uh, it, what what were you uh, asking before uh, it, you got uh, disconnected right in the middle of that? Yeah. Recently, the project manager from. Um, who manages the Fedora was laid off from Red Hat. And I was wondering if the, um, if there was a possible problem there. It, it, it's a sign that maybe Red Hat is going to stop supporting Fedora down the road. I mean, we're not gonna know that, but I'm just looking for some opinions here. Ah, I gotcha. Yeah, okay, I gotcha. we just uh, brushed on that uh, a little bit, but it, it's just not something yeah. that uh, I think we we can really speculate on. I mean, uh, yeah. plenty of folks have predicted the demise of Fedora before, and it's just not, I, I don't yeah. think it's in the cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, um, uh, it, 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 do you have anything else before we wrap up? Nope. All right. Sounds great. It's definitely great being here. Um, look forward to talking with you guys again sometime. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Right, yeah. Thanks for having us. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.